It gives me great pleasure to welcome Michael Rice. Talking on the impossible dream. Good morning. I guess it's actually, no, it's still morning, isn't it? Egypt. John and I are doing co-hosting a tour to Egypt in November if anybody wants to come play. It's going to be pretty awesome. First thing I'd like to do is I'd like to acknowledge this conference and I want to acknowledge John and Nancy and Peggy and Jeannie and all the people it takes to put it on. I'm sure nobody has, or maybe you've got an idea what it takes. And I was sitting down and doing some of the math as I was sitting in the back of the room during James's presentation and figured up that probably the presenters that you've seen here this weekend have given you about 500 years of inner work experience. And, you know, a lot of people want to worship somebody else's experience, but what you're dealing with is people who've had a personal experience perfectly ex personally experienced. And the idea is to create a space for you to have a personal experience personally experienced. And so I want to acknowledge the conference organizers, how important this diamond is in the southeast here, and acknowledge each and every speaker for the perspective that they brought to give each of us a whole picture of how this thing called human life works. So I'd like to do a standing ovation for the conference organizers and the speakers. Yeah. For sure. Now, let's just see if I'm going to be presenting the right material or whether I need to shift it. Has, has anybody that's here ever had any conflict in any of your relationships? <laughs> Could we see a show of hands? All right, two-handers, hands and feet back there. Okay, we've got the right audience. Has anyone, in order to avoid those conflicts, ever taken the geographic cure? You know where you go to the other side of the country where people will be different? And the person that picks you up at the airport finishes the sentence of the person that dropped you off started? How do they know what to say to you? How does this thing work? Or you enter into a new relationship and you read Riot Act. This is what I will not put up with. And then you wonder why six weeks, six months later, you're living with it. How does this work? Probably the greatest atrocity that has been done to us down through the ages and that we've bought into is that we have had hidden from us the fact that we are by nature creators. You and I are creators, which is an idea that everybody loves when the creation is going well. <laughs> but when it's not going so well, don't we all know who the problem is? And isn't their name always them? Has anybody got somebody in your life, if they just change, your life would be just fine? Anybody got one of those? <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> If you've been through a particular painful reality 87 different times with 42 different people, I'm going to invite you to notice that you're the only one that was there every time. The output of your mind is about you. And when you tell it to lie to you, it tells you lies. What's the most common lie on the planet? It's actually a series of lies that virtually all of us have engaged in. I mean, you look from the highest to the lowest. What's the most common lie? How many have ever done this? You made me so mad. You hurt me. You upset me. That disturbed, anybody ever done that? You, you really have a problem. You ever say that to somebody? I have a question. If they're the one with the problem, why are you the one with the pain? Something about that doesn't make sense. If they're the one with the problem, then they'd be the one with the pain. If you've got pain, and you think it's their problem, you really have a problem. <laughs> because you don't know where the problem is. Krishnamurti said, until the false is known as false, there is no truth. 
And most people live in a world where they absolutely abhor the truth. Remember the lie? You made me mad. You made me sad. Now, there's some interesting Harvard research that says that in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells fire, there are 10,000 literal me measurable units of electrical activity happening in the brain. The max amount of information that gets into conscious awareness is nine bits. That's all you get to see. And the nine bits follow the instructions given by your words. Now, in the work that Jeannie and I have developed, we have a definition for the act of trying to make somebody else responsible for what's happening inside of you. It's called denial. Yes, John and I are taking a group to Egypt, but denial is not a river in Egypt. <laughs> Our cruise is actually going to be on the Nile, not denial. <laughs> denial is the act of thinking or speaking as though something outside of you is the cause of something that is happening inside of you. Now you can listen from the highest to the lowest. You know, you watch the presidential conversations today and you'll notice that everybody's responsible for his state of mind. <laughs> One of the major victims of the world. When we think or speak, as though something outside of us is causing something to happen inside of us, we have to dissociate with the cause that is happening inside of us. What is dissociation? Dissociation means my mind creates or generates a picture, a world I call reality. And in order to hallucinate a picture, a perceptual construct, that you're the problem in my life. I have to lie to myself. You're the problem in my life. And in essence, here's what I'm doing. I'm saying to my mind, mind, whatever it is we're experiencing is mine, I know that, but I don't want to look at that. So please build me a reality according to these words. Charlie made me mad. Harry hurt me. And now my mind structures a literal construct made out of nine bits of data where I can really believe that Charlie or Harry caused my pain. The cost of doing that is you create a totally unnatural condition for a human being. You create an unconscious mind. Now, if you go back to the ancient scriptures, you'll notice that they said, take care of the heart for out of it are the issues in life. Now, up until just a few decades ago, we could not translate that concept in the West. When you go back to the original Aramaic, what you find is that the word heart means unconscious. So what they're saying there is, look at your own unconscious dynamics because that is the energy literally that radiates from you that brings forward or plays out that law of attraction. I like what James had to say this morning about the law of attraction. And on that level, I like to talk about the law of attraction as a distraction. Everybody going for their stuff. But literally, through the energetic patterns that I hold in me. You know, if you go to the opening words in the book of John where we're told it says, in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh. It's not what it says at all. You know, if Yeshua, the guy who's classically known as Jesus, sat in most churches in the West today, he'd say, that's all Greek to me. <laughs> now, the Greek scholars are probably not anytime soon going to admit that none of it was Greek. The man thought, he taught, he spoke in Aramaic. And there are at least five, we suspect six, of the world's major religions that came out of the Aramaic language. Everything else is Babel. Jeannie and I were in Europe a couple of years ago in our third country, and I'm listening to the Italians speak to each other, and I'm going, you know, we'd been in Sweden and Denmark. It's like, these people are making what we call sounds. They're not really sounds. They're flaps of skin moving in the throat that cause air to move, that cause the drum to fire, that cause brain cells to fire, and produces perception. But we're listening, I'm hearing this person who's 
making these sounds, we call them sounds, they're not really, they're just frequencies, making these frequencies with their mouth, and other people seem to be at least sort of understanding them. And it clicked to me, ah, this is Babel. Babylon. <laughs> right now, I'm speaking Babel. I'm speaking English. It's a language of Babel. And I'm not going to address the truth of anything here because anyone who's a student of the Course says, knows that it says, the truth cannot be spoken in words. You know, it's kind of like, well, Einstein says this, if you think you're separate or separated from the rest of humanity, you're living in an optical delusion. Your body-mind unit produces a world that isn't there. Now, the topic of the conference is change your thoughts. Do we really want you to change your thoughts? That's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. If I just d d defined a word as a tool of communication, would that be a reasonable definition? And words, when they're being used, indicate an interaction between two, right? Right now, you as a, a group are acting as one and I as the other, so we're using words to transfer information. So if I defined a word as a tool of communication, indicative of an interaction between two, would that be a reasonable definition for everybody? All right, so now what I'm going to invite you to do is to notice that there are words running inside your head right now. And you're not saying them to anybody else. If words are tools of communication indicative of an interaction between two, the question becomes, who's in there with you? <laughs> who's telling you the meaning of everything that you see? And if you are stuck in that perceptual mind, in that perceptual construct, you don't need to change your thinking, you need to change your mind. And I don't mean, you know, you've got an, a, a, an outfit on and you put a bangle on to change the look of the outfit you're wearing. That's not what I'm saying when I say change your mind. I'm saying get rid of the influence that the mind you think is real has over your perceptions, your decisions, and your behaviors and become engaged in a different mind. You know, it's interesting, Yeshua was addressing this issue with people, and he said to those who are stuck in what we call carbon-based memory, he says, your father's a liar. He's the father of liars. There's no truth in him. What mind was he talking about there? He said, I have a different father. I go to a different source. You know, John Van Aken talked about that original creation and where the creator in Job says to Job, where were you at the foundations of the earth? And God says, Job, you were with me. You were with God. And it wasn't your body. It was you who was there. And then, you know, you look at the two creation stories and we hear it's, I've had, heard people say, well, you know, it's kind of like Moses was getting a little senile because he told the creation story twice. He wasn't getting senile. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Remember he said, in the image and likeness of the creator, you were created, period. No talk about dirt, dust, atom, or any of that. You were created as a spirit being, as many people have said this weekend. And then, you'll notice then the next creation story starts, and it sounds like we're talking about two different things, but it's actually one. Because then it says, there was no man to till the soil, and in Aramaic it introduces the concept of Adam, Adamos, the red clay. And then it says, your physiology, your form, not the part of you that was in the creator at the foundations of the earth, but your physical form was created, or so-called physical. And then it says, 
And the creator breathed into Adamos, the red clay, the breath of life, and Nafsha, in Aramaic, became a living or an incarnated soul. So your created self is not this body-mind unit, but, well, let's see if we can determine what your created self is. I'd offer that I could stand up here for 10 years and try to describe the created self and there aren't enough words in the creation to do that because it is not yet deeply enough ingrained in our experience so there aren't words for it. But there is an experiential way to determine it. How many have ever held a newborn child? If you would, take a moment, go back to the moment, the first time you held that newborn and looked into that face. Tap into the essence of the newborn, if you would. And put a word to its essence. What word would you use to describe the essence of that newborn? Awesome. Awesome. Innocent. Angelic. Angelic. Pure, joy, love. Now, this is a question that Jeannie, my wife, and I have asked of tens of tens of thousands of people all over the globe. And 100% of the time, everybody's answer is always some variation on the theme of love. Why? Because everybody knows who we are, what we are. We are that presence of love. And the child comes into a world based in hostility or fear and has the love knocked out of them. And then they're sent out into the world in the vernacular, you might remember the song, goes back a few decades now. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. Did somebody send you on a journey to find love somewhere out there? And tell you that you were supposed to find somebody to love? And you were supposed to find somebody to love you? Well, I've got some bad news. Nobody has ever loved you and nobody's ever going to love you and you have never loved anyone, and you are never going to love anyone, that's a fraud of Adam, Adamos, the memory bank of this body-mind unit. You are love. It's not something you do. When you held the newborn, was the newborn loving you, or was the newborn love? If the newborn was love, then that's your nature too. And somebody tricked you by changing the meaning of its words. Interesting. If you read the writings of Vladimir Lenin, here's a man who's probably responsible for more deaths on planet Earth than anyone ever in existence. And he says, if you want to destroy a culture, change the meaning of its words. Almost every key word that would take you to your spiritual essence has had its meaning changed. One of the main ones is love. It's not something you do. It's who you are. It's not something you can get from someone else. It's who you are. You only get it when you get this thing to shut up. When this thing dies, and I don't mean your physiology. Remember Yeshua says, in order for you to live, you've got to die. Cancel the thought, but what does that mean? I have to go get a gun myself? No, no. There are two minds, there are two selves. The self that needs to die is a self based in the experience of the world that is stored in your physiology and because you were tricked into thinking you were a body and you were tricked into thinking that the world worked a certain way, your perceptual constructs show you a false world and show you that you are a body. Your body was not what was back there with the creator at the foundations of the earth. It was your being. We all came into the world as human beings. And for most, the world convinced us to give up being and buy into the realities constructed by a multi-generational database called the body-mind unit. That's what this thing is. If you are not functioning as love, then you are not human. At every moment where you lose the experience of 
The bliss and the ecstasy that comes from living as a human being, the, every moment that you spend without that experience is a moment where you are not human. And we have a dearth of humans on the planet today. I'd like to, at this moment, in the context of this conversation, there have been several people who have commented about Mr. Trump. I'd like to thank Mr. Trump. I think he has given the world one of the greatest gifts that it will ever be given. He has shown us our darkest underbelly. And if everybody stops talking about how he made me, he upsets me, he disturbs me, he makes me so mad. If everybody stops lying to themselves and goes, ah, here's somebody who's showing me my darkest underbelly, my rage, my fear, my terror, my trauma, my hatred, my vengeance, and uses that as a platform to do their work, then they're going to clean their own carbon-based memory system of vengeance and hatred and fear and grief and rage and condemnation and gossip and slander and vengeance. And then, having done that, they'll have carved out a space for love to show up in their physiology. An interesting line in the Aramaic Lord's Prayer, which incidentally is not a prayer. That's a whole other presentation. You actually go to our website, and the video is right on the front page of our website on the five keys of Yeshua. It's not a prayer, but there's a line in it that can be properly translated in the Aramaic of carve out a space in us, creator, for your wholeness. Carve out a space for your wholeness to arrive in this physiological device. And it's difficult for that wholeness to arrive in a place that's filled with hostility and fear. The mind of your true self was a mind that was represented by a man named Yeshua. They called him Yeshua the Christ, as though his name was Yeshua Christ, and it wasn't. Christ is not a name. It's, it's the name of an office. If I ran for mayor and I won, you'd call me Mike, Mayor Michael. Mayor isn't part of my name. Christ is an office in Aramaic. An office that we are all designed to occupy, and you are designed to put that mind that was in Christ into activity in your physiology in order to live as a human being. Now, if there's that mind, then what would you call the mind that rips you off for that? Would it be properly called the Antichrist? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Where is it stored? You know, most people have no clue that this man, Yeshua, and the book written about his work is a book about physiology, psychology, genetics, and how the world works. It's about physics. It's not about theology. And he was working to give people tools, not to tell them about it, but to give people tools and invite them to do the work that was required in order to get out of the liar. Remember the other thing that happened when Satan came with Job? God says, Satan, from whence come you? And Satan says, from going to and fro upon the earth, from going back and forth upon it. Now what is to and fro, back and forth? It's a statement of your past. It's what's stored in this multi-generational database from generations and generations and generations of insanity. Remember that story of the Jews wandering in the desert? 40 years they spent there. I mean, think about this for a minute, logically. This is a pretty bright group of people. Their writings have already shown that they know astronomy very well. They're lost for 40 years in a 30 square mile area. They don't have enough brains to go, the sun is rising in the east. It'll take us maybe a week or two, but let's walk east and we'll get out of the desert. <laughs> it wasn't about a hot, sandy place. The desert is a code word, another code word for the unconscious. Now remember how they got out of the desert. Do you remember what happened? They said the old generation had to die off. That didn't mean everybody in old physical bodies had to physically die. The root of the word generation is genari. It means cause. All of the old causes held in your multi-generational database had to be removed elsewise, so elsewise you would create out of that rather than create out of the state of being. This is about physics and physiology.
If we invited a modern day physicist to take a sample of your so-called body and check it out, they would tell you that the base element of your body is carbon. Does anybody know how many electrons there are in a carbon atom? Six electrons. Does anybody know how many protons there are in a carbon atom? Six protons. Does anybody know how many neutrons there are in a carbon atom? Six neutrons. Six, six, six. The Antichrist. And notice, the world has tricked you into looking out there for this dude with the red suit, the tail, and the pitchfork that's going to get you, and all the while it's within you, lying to you through your perceptual constructs. And we think the enemy is out there. Pogo had a great insight. He said, we have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. And here all you thought was, it was them. Boy, if only they'd change, I could be happy. You have a carbon-based device that stores everything that comes to it. And everything that comes to it that is not based in love, that is stored there, that you deny and dissociate from, becomes a literal energy that sets up a field. Back about hmm, 35, 38 years ago, I keynoted several times at Global Science Conference, and one year, Marcel Vogel, everybody knows Marcel probably, 23 year senior scientist from IBM, he had the kind of mind at the age of 11, Marcel invented and patented chemical light. You know, you go to a football game and you buy a, a light stick, it's plastic and there are glass tubes and you break it and the light chemicals mix. And you get, he patented that, he, he invented that at 11, his, money didn't, his family didn't have the money to patent it, he patented it at the age of 11. If you have a hard drive in your computer, the reason it works is because Marcel invented the magnetic coating for IBM that allows your hard drive to store information. That year at the Global Science Conference, Marcel brought a camera called a Delaware camera. And the Delaware camera, without going into a lot of explanations, some of you are probably aware of it, the Delaware camera takes a picture, is able to take a picture of the high energy waves that leave the mind when we think a thought. When you send out a thought, guess who's coming to dinner? The world works by a law called the law of resonance. And the law of resonance simply stated says this, when two energy fields are in tune or in harmony with each other, there's an exchange of information between them. The stronger of the two fields sets up a frequency that then is absorbed by the second field. You remember in high school in physics class, you hit a middle C tuning fork on a desk and it started to vibrate and without being touched, the second tuning fork started to vibrate? That's the law of resonance. Resonance creates motion. If I have two baby grand pianos and I go over here and I pound out a middle C and I go over to the second piano, I open the top and I look at the hundreds of strings in there, the only strings moving are going to be the ones related to a middle C. Resonance creates motion. In the inanimate world, another feature is brought forward in the human world. Resonance creates motion toward. It's called the law of attraction in some circles. It's just resonance. So let's say if I hold in my mind, mind energy, and if you go to the opening words in the book of John, it doesn't say in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh. It says in the beginning was the mind energy and the mind energy became flesh. Be careful what mind energy you engage in because it's literally going to become your physiology. So if I hold, let's say that, you know, I always get abused and taken advantage of in relationships. Cancel the thought then the high energy wave that radiates out from me, I call it the creative wave, sends out a message to all the world. You know, I just got rid of my last abuser. And the message that radiates, now I say in my head, remember the scriptures don't say, as a man thinketh in his head, it says a man thinketh in his heart. So in my head I say, I am ready for a wonderful relationship. And my relationship file starts to vibrate and a high energy wave goes out that says, hey world, I just got rid of my last abuser and I know I'm always abused in relationship. Are there any volunteers? <laughs> Has anybody ever noticed there's never a shortage of volunteers? <laughs> it's called creatorship, folks. Guess who's coming to dinner? The person with the perfect matching bag of garbage. And the world will call your relationships based in matching bags of garbage, love relationships. Anybody ever had a love relationship that turned into a hate relationship? 
Liar, liar, pants on fire. A relationship that is actually based in being, that is actually based in love, will never become anything other than a relationship based in love. Relationships based in matching bags of garbage, when people are in denial and dissociation and hide from themselves what they don't want to deal with, and one of our earlier speakers was talking about, you know, the first woman and the second and the third and the child and the... Here's the purpose of life. Life wants you to experience yourself as a human being, as love. That's all. And the creator, it seems, so set the system up that if you hold something that's less than love, then somebody's going to come and show it to you. The purpose of life is to kick you in the limitation. The purpose of life is to show you exactly what you're holding on to with which you are killing yourself. And anything based in hostility or fear that you're capable of experiencing is a frequency in your carbon-based memory, probably generational, that if you never forgive it, it is going to hunt you down and kill you. Because you're a creator. And if you think what you deserve, I mean, anybody here ever been to an organ recital? You know, where people are talking about who had the next organ removed, or who's getting the next organ removed, who had the last organ removed, mine was the worst, the doctor. Anybody ever been to one of those? <laughs> Listen to how often. Maybe you say it. That's to die for. That kills me. Cancel the thought. But when that becomes the predominant resonant frequency in your structure, then you, through the law of attraction, are going to be attracted to a cause of death. It's called creatorship. Life doesn't want you holding that. So the interactions you have, once you get past the initial phase, are the interactions that will show you the parts of your mind that need to be forgiven. Now, the non-being mind, Adamos, the red clay, the carbon-based memory system, has a cheap copy of everything that's real in the spiritual dimension. Carbon-based memory's cheap copy of forgiveness is, well, you know, you did something really terrible that caused all this pain inside me, but it's okay. I'll forgive you. Now, let's say... I go and stand of seven, in front of seven and a half billion people and forgive them. Have I done one thing to change the content of my carbon-based memory system or my creative process? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because when I let you off the hook for what's happening inside of me, I leave what's happening inside of me intact. We've been conned. Please never forgive anyone ever again. Please never forgive yourself for anything ever again because you can't. Forgiveness isn't about letting yourself off the hook. That's a Greek idea. Remember I said, yes, should say this is all Greek to me? That's a Greek idea. They substituted pardoning for, I let you off the hook, I let you, I let you, I let you. Every time I let you off the hook, I reinforce what's happening in me and I set up the field to create it again. In Aramaic, the process of forgiveness is the tool with which you go inside yourself and remove what is in your multi-generational database from the generations. It's how you get the old generations, the old causes to die off, to go. Nothing to do. And yet, you listen, you look at the whole world and they're all telling you about how you're supposed to forgive everybody. The biggest mistake you could ever make is to forgive anyone. Pardon them if you choose, but call it what it is, then do your forgiveness work. Ah, there's a part of me that's involved in creating this. Here's this person who's come so close to me that all they have to do is turn their head the right way. And they can resonate everything in me I've tried to hide from myself my whole life. This person is my ultimate gift. If I know what forgiveness is, if I know how forgiveness works, and if I know how to remove from my mind what never belonged in my mind. Imagine a world where tomorrow morning all virus software removal 
or pardon me, all virus removal software is disappeared from the world. And you have a child that's born tomorrow, and that child grows up and 25 years from now is a computer tech. Now, there's been no virus software for 25 years on the planet. They go into work one day, and they come home, and they're quite excited and quite delighted over the fact that they have put a half an hour of productive work in while they spent seven and a half hours fighting off viruses. And they go, wow, I had a great day today. And they think that was sane and reasonable. The virus removal software for the human energy system, for carbon-based memory, that was delivered to planet Earth 2,000 years ago was disappeared just about as quickly as it got here. And it was turned into a Greek idea that turned it backward, turned it on its head. We have lived for thousands of years without the virus removal software. We're suggesting not to change your thinking, but to change your mind. To go to that mind of love, of Christ that is in you, that is your birthright. And as the scriptures talked about, and this isn't a theological idea, your hope of living as a real human being. But its voice was called the still small voice. And you'll notice when the stress is up and the chips are down, it's really hard to listen to that still small voice. Anybody here ever walked into somebody's space totally committed to being loving and nurturing and caring? And all of a sudden found yourself functioning like a mad banshee? <laughs> what the hell happened? <laughs> you have a mad banshee. Someone just brought you the gift of showing you your mad banshee. If you stop thinking about and talking about them and you start forgiving your mad banshee, then you'll get free of hostility and fear. You'll be free of the viruses of hostility or fear. And for 2,000 years, it is cumulative. You know, if we had a, a, a hard drive, we put it in a computer, we put it online, it got a virus in it. No virus removal software. And we said, well, I'm going to make a, a new hard drive. I'm going to copy that one. I'm going to make a new hard drive. We've got a second hard drive. What's it going to have on it? It's going to have the original virus. If I put it online, what's probably going to happen? It's going to get two or three or four or 10 or 50 viruses. And I say, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new generation of hard drives off of this. What's the new generation of hard drives got? It's got every virus from the previous hard drive. From the previous, from the previous. It's cumulative. And every time you put it online, it acquires another 50 viruses. That's the state of humanity right now. Take a look at our political system. Is that a state of virus insanity or what? And take a look at your own life. Do you still have people that you point hostility and fear at and you think it's their problem? and you think it's their fault that this is happening in your physiology. If so, then you're living in denial. Remember denial, when I think or speak as though something outside of me is causing something that I am doing to myself with my own mind to happen, then I'm in denial. When I dissociate as a result of denial, when I hide that part of my mind I set up a literal measurable high energy wave that pulls somebody else in to do it to me. When they do it to me, they resonate what I'm in denial of. When that denial content moves, it formulates a picture that I call them, a literal construct in my mind. And I'm sure they're the problem in my life because they show up in my mind with my problem attached. And I really think it's their problem. But you'll notice, you're the one who's feeling it. We've developed a test in this work for determining whether or not what you're feeling is yours or not. Are you feeling it? That's all you need to know. Then you know that it is a frequency in your carbon-based memory system, maybe your own, maybe from the generations, it doesn't really matter. But when triggered into activity, that will create this nine-bit world of perception. And you'll think that you're actually looking at what's happening out there. I've got a quote here I want to pick up from, uh, from the CIA. Did you know that the CIA is teaching this stuff? Here it is. Literally, the CIA is teaching this. In fact, you can go to the CIA's website, CIA.gov, and take a look for the book called The Study of Intelligence. I don't know how many millions of your dollars were spent. And there's a chapter on perception. 
Now, they're studying perception because they want to get the best intelligence possible from their analysts. Here's what they say, quote, people tend to think of perception as a passive process. We see, hear, smell, taste, feel, stimuli that impinges upon our senses. We think that if we were at all objective, we record what is actually there. Yet perception is a demonstrably active process rather than passive. It consists rather, pardon me, it constructs rather than records reality. We live in a world of actuality. Each of your mind, if I asked everybody to stand up and say what's happened so far here in this presentation, I guarantee no two of you would say the same thing. I guarantee my reality is different from yours. My perceptual construct right now is different from yours, and yours is different from everybody in the room. And, and somebody taught you that you actually have a set of eyes and a set of ears, and that you look out through these peepholes and you see what's happening out there, and you listen with these and you hear what's happening out there. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You have never seen anything outside of you with your eyes. It's not possible, the eye is a one-way valve. Yes, light frequencies come in. Light frequencies cause brain cells to fire. Brain cells firing produce a thing called perception. It's interesting, the Course in Miracles says perception is something you created to take the place of what God gave you in creation. Really. So this construct in your mind comes as a result of the firing of content in your brain cell structure. Carbon-based memory. By definition, if it's coming out of carbon-based memory, it's from the past. If it's from the past, it's obviously not alive. If it's from the past, it's obviously dead. Yeshua said, let the dead bury the dead. Let the blind lead the blind. Thank you. <laughs> Everything that your carbon-based memory shows you is from the past. It replicates what's there. People who never learn to forgive People who never learn to go inside and remove the viruses from their carbon-based memory systems get to live the title of my book. Why is this happening to me again? It's kind of fun, we'll get people who call our center looking for the book. I understand you have this book, why are they doing this to me again? Why am I doing this to myself again? <laughs> You're a creator. If you think that someone else is the cause of what you're feeling. Your mind is a liar. And it's not a matter of changing that thinking. It's a matter of going to a new mind. Don't put lipstick on that pig. Don't put lipstick on that pig. Everything that comes from carbon-based memory is from the past and it is massaged to look like the matches the present. But you'll notice if you look at those dynamics, 20 years ago you had the same dynamics, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you had the same dynamics. If we went back and interviewed your mother and your father, at least one or both of them had that same problem dynamic. If we went back and interviewed your grandparents, somewhere between one and all four had the same dynamic. And if we interviewed your great grand and your great, remember they said the sins of the father will be passed, yea, unto three and four generations? Now let's get Aramaic on this. What's the word sin mean? Sin is an archery term. It's got nothing to do with what the Greeks told you. Sin is an archery term. When you fired at the bullseye and you missed the bullseye, the scorekeeper yelled sin, you're off the mark. That's all it means. If I put a virus, if I put hostility or fear, if I'm capable of producing hostility or fear, I have viruses in my structure that I better learn to forgive or they're going to kill me. Remember they said the wages of sin is death? I can remember being a kid and thinking, oh boy, God's going to get me for my sins. Nothing to do with God. It's just saying, here's how physiology works. You put energies that don't belong in the system, and they land. They land mind energy. Then there's, you, know, you, you go to those opening words in John. In the beginning was the mind energy, and the mind energy became flesh. 
Here's what the cell biologists are telling us today. You think a thought, the thought becomes a neuropeptide, becomes an actual molecule in your structure. The molecule circulates around in your structure until it finds a cell with a receptor site that matches it, lands on the cell. Now the cell biologists are saying that the cell replicates it. I don't think that's accurate. What actually happens is when that receptor site receives that neuropeptide, it inserts itself, the neuropeptide inserts itself, and it shows up in the cell as chemistry, literally. Thought becoming flesh. Whose thoughts become your flesh? You got any challenges in your flesh? Guess whose mind energy is behind it? Guess who needs to learn forgiveness? And guess who the universe is never going to let off the hook until you do forgive it? The universe is going to keep sending you someone to show you exactly what you're holding on to. And when your jaw clenches and your fist clenches when you start to remind yourself, this is mine. This is about me. I've got to break the lie that it's about anybody else. Now, how does forgiveness work? And because the world's got it backwards, forgiveness is backward. And most people don't want to accept it, and most people don't want to do it. Here's the missing piece. How do you remove every bit of hostility or fear from your carbon-based memory system so that that thing shuts up and your carbon-based memory becomes available to that mind that was the mind of Christ, the mind of love. How do you do that if that's the still small voice and this one's always screaming and raging with its hostility, its fear, and its pain and blaming everybody else? How do you do that? I want to introduce the forgiveness process to you from the Aramaic, and it's strange, very strange. It's totally backward. And most minds repel it, repulse it, and don't want anything to do with it. Here's the missing key. Remember that Harvard research I told you about? 10,000 brain cells are fine. There are literally 10,000 measurable units of electrical activity happening. In that time frame, it's been estimated that the actuality contains about 20 trillion bits of data. So here we are in perhaps a 20 trillion bit world 10,000 brain cells firing, our perceptual construct made of nine bits of data. What causes the mind to produce that particular perception that is based in pain or trauma or vengeance or hatred or whatever it is? What causes that to happen? What controls, I should say this two questions actually, what controls it, what causes it? The thing that causes is the fact that the content is there. The thing that Cause it, or the, that brings it about, that controls the game, is you'll notice, unless you're just a generally really miserable person, that you're pretty happy with everybody in your world as long as they're doing what you want them to do. <laughs> Have I noticed that? And you notice that when somebody does something you don't want them to do, that's when your hostility and fear-based mind takes over. Well, how does that work? What's going on here? When you realize, and this is the most quoted research in psychology, when you realize 10,000 bits of data are firing and only nine bits get into awareness, something sorts out and causes the mind to use the nine bits that is building this perceptual construct. Make sense? What causes it? What controls it, I should say? Your goals. When you load a goal into your mind, Let's say, you know, I have this goal that this person should just cherish me deeply. And they come along and puke on me. Now, the common culture would say, well, they made me so mad and they rejected me. Boy, I hate them. If there was mad and hate and rejection inside of me, that's what I'd say, out of carbon-based memory. <laughs> and when I realize that the goal that I loaded for them to cherish me has accessed my file in my mind on being cherished. And in that file is fear and anger. So when I load that goal, and it's a perfectly good goal, nothing wrong with the goal, but when I load that goal to be cherished, if I have hostility and fear in my file on being cherished, then hostility and fear is at the root of my perception. And I say, they made me, and I've dissociated from what's at the root of my perception. I have an unconscious mind. What does Yeshua say about that? He says, you must forgive from your heart the wrongs of your brother. 
Does that, is that a bleeding heart Greek statement, forgive from your heart? No. He's saying you've got to remove from your unconscious everything that you put into your brain's image of everyone else, your brother, that you think belongs to them. And how do you do that? Well, when you realize that your goals drive the perceptual process and there's a dissociated part of your mind that holds pain that you don't think is even yours that's coming into your perceptual process, then you gotta find a way to get out of this perception that is so pained and into the root of the pain. How do you do that? In Aramaic, the word forgive is shabag. And the word for shabag in Aramaic means to cancel. Now, in a particular situation, do I cancel you? No, that's murder, probably not a good idea. Do I cancel myself? No, that's suicide, probably not a good idea. But in every circumstance where I'm in some sort of pain or trauma, pretending somebody else is the problem, I can always cancel the goal that's driving my pain to perception. And when I cancel the goal that's driving my pain perception, and Gene's gonna hand out a worksheet to you on how to do the forgiveness process. When I cancel the goal that's driving my perception, here's what happens. My perception collapses. Remember 9-11? The towers went down on their own footprint at free fall speed. We could do a whole conversation about that. That's a different conversation. We're not gonna to touch that one. But, but imagine that when you cancel what drives your perception, what happens is your perception collapses in on itself. When it collapses in on itself, that's the experience you had the other day when we were standing up in the hallway. When it collapses in on itself, it gives you access to what's in the unconscious. And when that pathway is open and you bring what you've been hiding from yourself perhaps for generations forward and you bring it forward in the presence of love, then that which is based in hostility or fear, exposed to the mind of Christ in you, dissolves. That's forgiveness. You can only do that for yourself. You can't forgive anyone else. You can pardon them. Please, if you're going to pardon people, great thing to do, but it's got nothing to do with forgiveness. Pardon someone, get out of the Greek con, and recognize that once you've pardoned someone, you're pardoning them for something that's moving in you and you want to clean up and forgive what's moving in you in order to empty your carbon-based memory system of all the noise of the generations so that a space is carved out in you for wholeness to arrive. If you've got a cell phone, I'm gonna ask you to take your cell phone out. Take it out. Go to your app store. <laughs> Type in the words, Heartland Aramaic Forgiveness. You'll see an app come up. It's a free, guided, totally, completely private app. First one in the world that shows you how to do forgiveness. And so we invite you to take it and put it to work in your life. Heartland, Aramaic, forgiveness. A R A. M A I C. Physicist David Bohm says this. So that'll walk you through the whole process. The general assumption is that thought is just telling you what things are, and it is not doing anything. That you are inside there deciding what to do with the information. But you don't decide what to do with the information. Thought runs you. This is a physicist who worked with Einstein. He actually worked on the math that helped to create the atomic bomb. Sad story. And he worked with David, or pardon me, with um, uh, Carl Pribram at Stanford University in developing the whole atomic model of the mind. Here's what he said. 
Thought gives that false information that you're running it, that you are the one who controls thought, whereas actually thought is the one which controls you, each one of us. Thought is creating divisions out of itself and then saying that they are there naturally. This is another feature of thought. Thought doesn't know it's doing something and then it struggles against what it's doing. It doesn't want to know that it's doing it and thought struggles against the results, trying to avoid those unpleasant results while keeping up with that same way of thinking. That is what I call, David Bohm says, sustained incoherence. An incoherent frequency is a frequency that does not belong in a system. It destroys the system. Put on a new mind. You put on a new mind by being out of your mind, what the world calls the mind, by quieting this carbon-based memory system. He says, thought can deceive us about anything and everything. There is no limit to the power of deception. If you continue with the thinking of the world, and remember I said the non-being mind has a cheap copy of everything real in the true world, in the world of being. The non-being mind's cheap copy of thinking is cycling information. All information cycled from carbon-based memory is from the past. When you put on a new mind, you can do that because you shut the old one up. If you don't shut the old one up, there will always be a battle going on. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. Your own internal Battle of Armageddon. And I'd like to close with a quote from Jonas Salk, who did a whole lot more than created the Salk vaccine. Here's what he says. Instincts tell us that if we recognize the interconnectedness of all of us, that we can access the power of love and forgiveness, releasing a power greater than atomic energy, the end result of forgiving is to release the power in the nucleus of the individual, a power much greater in its positive effects than atomic power is in its negative. If we can be courageous, courageous one more time than fearful, trusting one more time than we are anxious, cooperative one more time than we're competitive, forgiving one more time than we are vindictive, loving one more time than we are hateful. We would have moved forward to the next breakthrough in our evolution. One of the most important things you can do, he says, as a scientist, is to be a good ancestor. Take on, forgive everything based in hostility or fear in you. Carve out a space for your true nature love to show up in the world. Do this, 